It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. If you've never heard of a Christian movement scholars call the Prosperity Gospel, chances are you've at least heard of some of its most famous proponents, like Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar, or Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. The Prosperity Gospel is not officially associated with any particular denomination. It's more like a style of Christianity that emphasizes God's desire to bless people, particularly and literally when it comes to wealth and health. Through your faith, you can become healthy and rich. When historian Kate Bowler set out to write a book called Blessed, A History of the Prosperity Gospel Movement, she found herself being pulled into the book's narrative herself in surprising ways. Bowler recently published a powerful follow-up column to Blessed in the New York Times. She's here to help us understand the frequently lampooned but incredibly influential Prosperity Gospel Movement. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. Kate Bowler is Assistant Professor of American Religion at Duke Divinity School, and she's the author of a book called Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel. And Kate, you join me today from Atlanta. Thanks for being on the show. So glad to be here. So the prosperity gospel, this is something that uh, that deals with wealth and health and other issues like this. It's a way of viewing Christianity with those things foremost in mind. But it's not an organized church. You describe it more like a network of preachers and conferences and media networks that all hit on these similar themes, how Christianity relates to wealth and health. So your book is – it's a rare book of academic history because you bring the story right up to the present and you even include – your own direct experiences and, and observations here. You're not a just a detached researcher of bygone eras where yeah. no one can argue back with you. Uh, <laughs> you're like a present observer. So I thought it'd be cool to begin with your experience on on a Holy Land tour in 2008 with Benny Hinn. So talk about Benny Hinn and what that experience was like. Oh, sure. Well, it was um, one of those things where you're desperate to do research, you're a graduate student, and you need money, sweet, sweet money, while studying a theology of money, and it makes you feel like a hypocrite. <laughs> uh, so actually, originally, I ended up seeing Benny Hinn both when he came to Raleigh, but also in the land where Jesus walked, in part because the only money they had for graduate students was international. So I was like, well, holy land, here I come. It's not too bad, though. That's a good... <laughs> It's only slightly pernicious. So I, uh, yeah, I went with um, 800 or 900 American tourists, mostly, uh, to uh, to see all the different major sites of Jesus's ministry. Uh, but it ended up being just a whole. It, it tried to answer a whole series of questions I'd had. I mean, the first was, what what will people pay for a miracle of their own? I mean, these are vastly expensive trips. And for the most part, Benny Hinn is known as a famous healer. So were these people expecting a miracle? Was this just tourism? Um, what are their hopes and dreams as they go into this? And it was, it was everything I could have hoped for and more. I met the most delightful people as I traveled around on a bus in the heat of an Israeli summer, <laughs> which, as it turns out, is a perfect opportunity to see people use positive confession, who we'll talk about later, the use of positive words in action. So there was this one just delightful person named uh, Debbie, who was like tailor-made for the prosperity gospel. She was always walking uh, 10 or 15 feet in front of the tour guide, explaining to us what we were about to see. Not because she was trying to be obnoxious, because she was so excited to be there. She was like, isn't it wonderful? Can you even believe we're here? I mean, the number of times I heard her say, just pinch me. <laughs> she was she was the kind of consummate prosperity person in action. With in, like catchphrases. In, oh my gosh, yeah. She had her own absolutely just perfectly soundbite ways of expressing her theology. And then there was... And then there was this other lovely lady who was like 70 something. She was traveling by herself and you could tell she was there mostly for the apocalyptic stuff and they weren't getting into the sweet, juicy details of Armageddon enough for Megiddo, the kind of mountaintop where the end times will, uh, armies can be seen. So she was a little annoyed by the whole thing and she was accidentally negatively confessing all over the place. And so you could just see people turn against her very quickly and be like, don't confess that, don't make it true. And uh, so it was it was both kind of fascinating on a personal level to to look at the kind of little ecosystem of what prosperity theology is like in action. Like, yeah, you're seeing this group of people who you talk about positive and negative confession. It's a it's all about the type of impact that a person can have uh, in yes, their interaction with God, depending words. on just the words that they use. Absolutely, that words are themselves a spiritual power that can be unleashed with direct negative or positive consequences. And normally we kind of look at the 
you know, the, the health and the wealth, but it was, it was kind of much more fun to see it on a very mundane level and the way people try to inculcate this as a kind of spiritual habit. And you kind of got sucked into the story a little bit here as well. When you say <laughs> in the book, you say a very unscholarly thing occurred. I got sick. And then yeah. you kind of became part of the story through what the, yeah. how the other tourists reacted. Oh, I was a giant puke fest. It was terrible. <laughs> it was <laughs> terrible. But just, I, you know, I had heat stroke and I'm terrible at drinking water. And then all of a sudden, you know, my, my eyes are squeezed tightly shut as I'm just trying to get through this bus ride to one of the highlights of the trip, which was supposed to be this um, healing service on the Sea of Galilee. And it was kind of one of the only times in which Benny Hinn actually showed up to these events uh, because normally he was actually quite inaccessible. Mm. And so everyone was really excited. Meanwhile, they kept having to pull over the bus for me <laughs> to be violently ill. And uh, and meanwhile, just with my eyes squeezed shut on the bus, um, whenever I get back on, I could just, I could start to feel hands touching me, just trying to spiritually, like, to pray for me, but mostly to try to exercise what they worried were demons that were, that had kind of managed to get they would say a foothold, right? Because of, you know, maybe unconfessed sin. I mean, that's the thing about the prosperity gospel is they, ha they actually have produced lists and lists of, un of, of things that might be wrong with you if you find the symptoms to be true. So if something bad's happening to you, here's a list of things you can look through to see if you've done any of them wrong. So they were very happy to list them for me. I mean, super kind people. Did they but, know you were a researcher and the, could that oh, yeah. have played a factor? Like this is kind of a, sure. not a believer like we are kind of a thing. Yeah, I think they felt, I'm, I mean, who knows what they really thought, but I, my sense from what they were saying was they thought I was, you know, it, it was that I was an incomplete Christian, that there's just a few extra steps that I could take. And that in this case, maybe and this is they very helpfully was like, well, you said you talk a lot. Maybe it's something you said so that I had sort of unleashed the negative spiritual forces that caused these demons to come inside of me. Did any of them so, suggest that Benny Hinn could come and, and, you know, he's a faith healer. So what about people yeah. who were here on the trip that had not just you, but other people, I assume, that had conditions? I thought it was so odd that they are so deeply American bootstraps do it yourself. And that you'd think that on a celebrity tour with a faith healer that they'd be, bring me right up to the front. But instead, they each had sort of careful instruction of things I could do by myself and that this would be the sustainability of my faith. Like, well, you can do it once here in the bathroom and you can do it anywhere you like. And I think a lot of them practice their faith in that way in which these healers and even healers are inspirational, but that they really believe that this is a, a journey they have to take alone. So we'll circle back around at the end of the interview to talk more about how your ethnographic research, uh, how your kind of your personal interaction with believers um, helped shape the book story. But right now, let's take a look closer at how you define the prosperity gospel, what it is at the moment. And you include an appendix where you dig more deeply into definitions. There's a fascinating line in the appendix where you say, uh, believers themselves may avoid labels, but they do observe boundaries. In other words, what you're calling the prosperity gospel isn't necessarily how these believers would self-identify. So let's talk about that. Sure. I, it was the main sort of thorn in my side for doing this project. And I think partly why people hadn't really done it before was no one likes to be called a prosperity preacher. It's kind of a disparaging term. The problem is, is there's no good alternative. I tried desperately to convince everyone to call it the faith movement, but then it was just more work for me and no one understood what I was talking about. And like faith's so, such a fundamental principle. I know. Like, like they're, <laughs> they're for it. I mean, yeah. it just, it's like, just, where's your non-faith Christians? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. They are going strong. <laughs> exactly. So it ended up being, I mean, so awkward because it mostly just ends up being a list of people you like or don't like. Mm -hmm. So that's why I had this endless appendix and series of appendices because I wanted to show people, look, there's, there's different kinds of markers that we can try to use to create some um, to create some sense of framework of what we're looking for. And I do think that these labels are fluid. I mean, I've seen people be prosperity preachers at one season of their life and kind of move away from it. I think we need to realize just how shaped we are by our associational connections. Anyone, any of you lovely scholars out there who once used to say, I speak to another person or talk about this now uses the word discourse, <laughs> knows that we all just start to look and talk and <laughs> sounds alike. That's why we all wear tweed. So I yeah. just, you get the same thing with these preachers is, you know, you can see people and I can just watch them year by year gravitate into a new kind of language. And sometimes too, it's also topical. Like someone will go through a, a fundraising campaign for a new building. And it's not just that they're trying to get money, which there is a natural connection with fundraising, but people are, are, 
are grappling for language they can use. And very often they'll kind of draw in a specialist in the prosperity gospel. It's like, okay, this is our language, faith for blank. So, um, so it's different things I looked for was a discourse was <laughs> sort of talk about uh, which language they use. So are there any weird words to us that they might use that help mark them off as a discrete community? So words like Rima or a special revelation, a hundredfold blessing. So anytime someone's using spiritual math. So I looked at language. I looked names at names for God. Is another one. Na- yes, that's right. Names for God. There's always Jehovah Jireh. My provide. I like my friends who say any prosperity person who says Jehovah Jireh, my provider. There's always a way to make it cool. It's I've heard, I've heard it in a million raps already. So and it's you. hard because you cite a time poll where about 17 percent of Christians self-identified as being part of a prosperity movement, but but so, a full two thirds of Christians polled agreed that God wants people to prosper. So this idea of God's desire for His children to not just survive or not just like help each other, but to actually like prosper in the terms of wealth and health is very prominent, even when people yeah. don't self-identify that way. And sometimes people can have, a, without a theological prosperity gospel, they can very easily have a performative one. So very often we might see in a mega church with their living nativity scene Advent experience and their, not just the slick and shininess of it, but the implicit message that Christianity will always make your life better, this sort of endlessly therapeutic and becomes, becomes a series of formulas and guarantees Um, And this becomes, has just become such an inherent part of our culture, it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish between a performative prosperity gospel and a theological one. How about denominationally? It seems that um, prosperity gospel can be found among different types of Christians, uh, more fundamentalist-minded, Pentecostal, evangelical. How did you see it mapping onto denominational identity? It totally boggled my mind that every, I will say, I will say every, I will say almost every major denomination has one giant prosperity mega church that makes them all a tiny bit embarrassed because they know it's not theological God part, but it's so successful. They just can't bring themselves to kick it out. And so I've interviewed all kinds of denominational prosperity preachers who it's much easier to tell if you go into their bookstore that they're that they're much more comfortable in a neo-Pentecostal circuit in which they travel with like-minded people, but that they also typically went to a mainline or something seminary and have their own allegiances. And so you can see, you know, there's a United Methodist Prosperity Church. There are uh, giant Southern Baptist ones, even though the Southern Baptists are typically the loudest and most vocal critics. Uh, You just, I mean, when I went to the Joyce Meyer conference, sometimes I just, I'm the loser who sits around and looks at which church buses are there. In the same way that when I go to a prosperity mega church, I'm always looking for the vanity plates at the front that says prayed for. Yeah. So, you know, if I look at the the, the church vans, there'll be a, a Moravian church, a UCC church. Uh, there's just, there seems to be really no limits to its accessibility and appeal. How about regionally? This was really interesting. You had some maps in here where you showed that there are actually few that exist in the Mountain West region of the United States, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming. Did yeah. you get a sense for why that was? Uh, Mormons and mountains were my only guess yeah. for that. Uh, that was my best guess. Because we have but like I, evangelical churches here, so why not? Oh, no, why not a mega church? Oh, and I thought maybe like in the land to focus on the family. Surely there would be a a bajillion, which is also a technical term. Um, and those charts are a tiny bit misleading because I was only able to track the theological proclivities of mega churches because that's what I had access to. So right. it's it's you know very likely that there's a million small ones, but. I think there's some really important work to be done on it as a Southern phenomenon, but also the ways in which it has traveled and taken on different flavors. So it's very popular in the Northwest. I mean, the number of Seattle prosperity megachurches, and they're kind of cooler. Like they've got their not completely distressed jeans. Distressed jeans. You know, not their totally artful graphic tees. You don't want to fully heal the jeans. No, you and it can't be shiny. Yes. God forbid they be shiny. Yeah, they've managed to do the kind of like puffy vest cool hmm. um, with a never a soul patch in sight. And I love I there so they've managed to be and I mean this is the thing about it being if you just get to a national story if someone says, you know, is this an American gospel? Well, that's the problem is it's so infinitely exportable that it might be American or it might be southern for a moment and then because it's wonderfully market savvy, then poof, it's suddenly completely different. Yeah, the underlying messages of 
achieving wealth and having good health and this idea yeah. that God wants that for you. So that that's adaptable to all sorts of different cultural settings. Yeah. How about yeah, congregation like, size? Um, well, this was the part I was most surprised about is that it's not dominant on the whole in mega churches. So if you look at the majority of mega churches, even though people kind of, I think, accidentally collapse those categories, they're, most mega churches are not prosperity mega churches. It's just that they're incredibly top heavy. So they have more of the, I can't remember what I put in my glorious chart only because I'm I think maybe 40% or something like that, um, of the largest churches, so 10,000 plus, are prosperity. And so there really is a tight association between market and media savvy and the ability to have language, the, the kind of the, the resonance between church growth language and formulas for growth and a prosperity message. They've man- managed to draw all those things together into a really powerful recipe for success. And then some of the leading celebrities, we mentioned Benny Hinn, you mentioned um, Joyce. Mm-hmm. There's Creflo Dollar, T.D. Jakes, Paula White. I could go on. So, and, and these people sometimes, some of these leaders also display conspicuously uh, wealth in the sense that they might have expensive suits and vehicles and things like this. For some Christians, it would look askance at that and sort of say, this is unseemly. Uh, but within the prosperity gospel, it's almost as though these figureheads serve as representative of the promises that are open to anybody. And so it would it makes sense within their context for them to display what they would call God's blessings. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's I mean, and it really kind of gets down to their sense of the economy, that it being God's economy, not necessarily. So there's not in that sense, it's not limited. It's not defined by the downturn. Um, it's not, uh, yeah, there are no barriers to economic success. And so what works for them can work for anyone. All they have to do is show them how. And that underlying principle is God desires to bless you. So they're yes. less focused on Jesus saves or you're a sinner and you need that. I mean, not that they don't ever talk about that, but that they're more focused on God's desire to bless. Well, it does get back to their atonement theory. I mean, I, I think I'm, I underestimated before I did the project how much of this they root in resurrection power. Hmm. So they really do think that on the cross, God breaks the power of death and of, of sin stranglehold over us, but also poverty and disease. And so that's where you get into some slightly awkward theological wrangling where it's it is easier to it's 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 got an easier visual analog to say that Jesus died for our sins when they have all the language of by his stripes we are healed we see a suffering Christ and so in that there's a profound connection between our suffering and and Christ's um, but it's harder with the money stuff because they really had to reach for it there's a lot of baby Jesus gets what does he get Blair yeah he's gold and frankincense <laughs> and murder yeah so, he yeah. didn't get any he didn't get seaweed crackers he got. He got the whole bonanza. And so there's that. I like the one of Joseph and Mary on a donkey. And that was like the Cadillac back then. It's just like like that. Yes. Or his robe (laughs) must have been really nice. That's why they tore it. Or, you know, they needed to have a treasurer. And so they must have had lots of money. So, but those are, it's usually only the very, it's the Mike Murdoch's. It's the, um, not worried about being disreputable sometimes (laughs) types who, are more likely to go for gold and make those arguments. So that kind of gives us an overview then. We it's this it's this movement within Christianity that focuses on wealth and health. It's not specific to any particular denomination. There are regional expressions of it. It's involved in some mega churches. Congregation sizes vary. There are celebrity preachers uh, that are involved who have ministries not just uh, locally where they're at, but also through television and uh, and the internet, and this underlying idea that God desires to bless uh, and that the individual can tap into that. So that's kind of in a nutshell. Um, yeah. That's Kate Bowler. She's assistant professor of American religion at Duke Divinity School. We're talking about her book, Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel. Let's talk about the historical development. So rewind back to the 19th century, and you locate the roots of it in these three intersecting streams. There's Pentecostalism, there's something called New Thought, capital N, capital T, and then just American ideals of pragmatism and individualism. So talk about, especially New Thought, I think, uh, might be a new idea for people. Let's start there. Yeah, I mean, New Thought is one of those things that 
you'll recognize the ideas before you recognize its origins. That the idea that the mind is a very powerful incubator, that what you think can possibly come true, that your words are potent spiritual forces that can bring things into reality. And so all of this sounds to us probably just a little bit like Oprah, but in truth, it, the secret. Yes, always the secret. Um, it it has religious kind of sectarian religious roots in which uh, this group of thinkers and speakers uh, who had inherited a lot of their ideas from Christian science uh, decided that Christian science's um, elevation of the mind over the body was not entirely accurate, but perhaps it was that the mind could uh, realign the body such that we could, if, and alignment is the right language because they kind of thought of it like a divine channel between us and God. And so its founder, it, it's not really like that because it's kind of a loose conglomeration, but its kind of main thought founder is Phineas Quimby, who was a touring mesmerist for a while, which That's I really That's a great like. name too. Phineas <laughs> Quimby, and I long to be a touring mesmerist. Yes. Where have all the mesmerists gone? All right, anyway. Yeah, exactly. My dad did want to write a series of historical novels in which the uh, the detective is a touring mesmerist. Yes. Who, uh, who solves problems in mysterious ways. Uh, but so New Thought, um, its founder's Phineas Quimby, and he has this experience in which he's quite sick, um, but his horse carriage breaks and he's forced to run up a hill alongside his horse. And he finds that strangely, he actually feels better than he did before. And he wondered that perhaps his mind might be more powerful than he'd realized. And, uh, and at the moment, Americans were sort of high on self-discovery. There was a real rhetoric of self-mastery. You know, home gyms were big. Uh, the muscular Christianity that saw the titans of industry as commanding and changing America. So there was a real sense that um, that people were more powerful than they perhaps had once thought. And so New Thought picks up on this and says, yes, uh, the mind is incredibly powerful. And they become popular writers for like Ladies Home Journal and not only um, – kind of more purely academic religious texts, which is how they started, uh, mostly focused on healing, but then gradually became popularizers of their own message. And in so doing, kind of disappeared into the American ethos. So it became very hard for people to even really remember where those thoughts came from because they had popularized so very quickly. And this, you, you call it a high anthropology. It's this idea that rather than being sort of depraved sinners in the hands of the angry God, you have children of God that God created for the purpose of blessing their lives and sort of, you know, exalting them. Yeah, that's the one thing I forgot to mention is that, I mean, they started off with health in the sense of alignment of mind and body and were kind of popular healers. But they, by the turn of the 20th century, had turned toward wealth and success literature that was becoming more common more broadly. And so they were very quick to say, you know, this is going to get you this is going to change your life in every possible way from getting you that job to helping your family to um, bringing in that extra income. So they, they become the kind of some of the first real prosperity preachers. So you talked about sort of the death and resurrection of Christ as being this source of power that people could tap into. So they saw the way into that power as positive thought. Positive thought would lead to positive outcomes. That was faith. So Jesus purchased salvation on the cross, but also guaranteed his followers prosperity if they would tap into the power that he's made available. And yeah. so that kind of gives, that's 19th century. Now we get up into uh, World War One, World War Two. People are looking for miracles at this time. Um, what are some sure. of the things that are happening in the movement now? Sure. Well, New Thought kind of gave it its language of the mind, but it was Pentecostalism that largely gave it its, its Christian framework. And so in the 20s, um, when, when there was uh, just a peak of healing revivalists traveling around the country and they were grappling with, well, what the question of what heals some and, and, you know, why do some get healed and some people don't? And they're looking for that recipe, which of course they are because they're results-based healing 
revivalists who have to be accountable for those questions all the time under these big tents around America. So they very quickly tap into new thought language, I think quite unconsciously. Um, it was about, just in the atmosphere. Yeah, I think that's right. And, uh, you know, there's some sense that sometimes some of them shared libraries or definitely knew about each other. But I think for the most part, it was just the way people were speaking. And it became such a, it sort of, it suited their, um, their sense of justification and sanctification so easily that it just sort of slipped in. And uh, so by the time we get to after World War II, and everybody is experiencing an economic influx for the most part, except African Americans who've largely been barred uh, from these uh, often government subsidized privileges. Um, they, you know, we see new cars in people's driveways, new modern conveniences, and all of a sudden the language of healing that had been so popular before World War One is not quite the miracle many people are looking for. Medical and science so, has improved as well, too, so there's that. Yeah, it's less terrifying. They don't need to call it heroic medicine. People need to be a little less heroic to get it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and all kinds of vaccinations had poured in, making previously terrifying childhood diseases no longer quite so scary. And so people are looking for a language that both explains and sometimes justifies uh, this new boost. And so Pentecostals really start to expand on the language of health and extend it into wealth. So the same promises they would make for a healed body, they're now willing to make about miraculously multiplying wallets and new, new promotions. And this, of course, coincides with the advent of the popularity of television. So we have a new kind of celebrity preacher, an Oral Roberts, who is both handsome and rugged, the roll up your sleeves kind of healer who also wants you to touch the screen against his hand so that you too can be healed. He's wonderfully charismatic and compelling. And you just have a whole host of these types who are promising money and a healed body and restored families and all the goods that we all long for. And it becomes um, very, very popular within Pentecostalism. It's increasingly contractual too. You talked about in the book, Kenneth Hagin and his law of faith that, that yes. almost sets out this like f exact formula Oh, yeah. They, early on, they loved formulas. I mean, they would have to back away from it eventually. But I think they were thinking quite, I mean, they were they were just trying to think pragmatically about what they could, they could guarantee people. And so they were willing to make quite bold promises. There were some yeah. people that started withdrawing support, right? Some, some believers, even Pentecostal denominations started backing away and saying, okay, there, there are excesses here that we don't agree with. Oh, I mean, in the 1950s, the prosperity preacher was not a reputable figure in Pentecostal denominations. I mean, I read these sweet, sweet stories of denominational and from archives from Pentecostal denominational leaders that are like, oh, this guy again. Like, what are we <laughs> like going to see them, an embarrassment to them. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you can see even through the typewriter notes that they're just like, blarg, not you. <laughs> so it was certainly, um, it took, a, it took almost a full generation for many Pentecostal denominations to, to deal with the fact that they just weren't going to go anywhere. You also talk about the rise of therapy culture that sort of continues through this period. So Norman Vincent Peale has this power of positive thinking. And so this is still in the atmosphere as well. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, it was pretty amazing that by the time psychology became its own profession in the late 1800s and then entered the mainstream, that therapeutic language and what's better, the therapeutic pastor became just such an American standby. And so it's almost hard for people to to use language that isn't psychological. It became so completely persuasive. And this just became really sort of crystallized in the positive thinkers. So in the Norman Vincent Peels and his lovely wife, Ruth, in the Robert Schulers and his lovely wife, Arvella, who used to go around and take out the negative words from hymns, like, what a wretch like me, because it just wasn't theologically appropriate. And so we see a, a kind of a turn away from Christian language that just toward that high anthropology that we were talking about, in which people no longer be want, of, want to be thought of as sinners, but as people capable of so much more. Fundraising becomes important, you say, uh, at, at this time. There's this idea of sowing and reaping. And I don't know if you saw, John Oliver had a piece uh, just a little while ago where he had started responding to these mailers where they would say, you know, sow a seed, give us five bucks, it'll turn into, you know, this type of thing. So this has roots back here post-World War II era when when these ministries really start 
fundraising. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, and partly it's because it is incredibly expensive to keep things on the air. So there's a natural relationship then between needing to raise more money and and having a more aggressive or more specific series of certainties. Uh, that was always my favorite thing in college was I was many people's only Christian friend. And so they would put these mailers in my mailbox. So I had just, I have decades worth of <laughs> healing green oil and special. Yeah, like a, like a napkin or something. Well, it is, I mean, Pentecostalism, like Catholicism, is a wonderfully material faith. So, for example, after a famous... Uh, preacher would be done with his giant tent from a tent ministry, then they would want it, they would cut it into squares and mail it out as part of a fundraising campaign, assuming that sort of all of the spiritual energy of what had transpired there had somehow absorbed into the fabric. It's I mean it's an almost sacramental theology in which things things take on more importance. So just regular practices we have historically done for healing, like laying on of hands or um, any of those things become just much more important. It's a very tactile faith. So yeah, the healing, <laughs> the the stuff really kicks off after World War II in particular. But uh, in truth, by the late 1970s, just everything about American churches are getting bigger. They're getting savvier. Their church growth movements have really taken off. So we have the kind of advent of the mainstream mega church in the 80s and the 90s. And uh and everything has just grown by scale. And so because of that, the fundraising has to grow correspondingly. Right. Um, in fact, so let's talk more about wealth in particular. Um, in the book you write, the most controversial aspect of the prosperity gospel movement was its radical claim to transform invisible faith into financial rewards. And we already mentioned some of the unusual justifications that they would give from the Bible, such as the gifts that were given to Jesus, uh, represented the gold and things so this is what god wants for you the donkey of joseph and mary but then there started to break out uh scandals and divisions in the movement uh based on excesses so let's talk about that for a minute and i think this is to be honest when i picked up the book to begin with this is the first place my mind went was to think of tv preachers sort of asking for money and and this sort of thing so what sort of scandals happened that rocked the movement Oh, the late 80s were a tough time to be a prosperity preacher. It was that three things kind of seemed to happen in succession and congealed in the American public the idea that the television preacher was not to be trusted. And the first one was um, that Oral Roberts had fallen, uh, I think, at least $7 million or something short in a fundraising campaign. I will say, though I never thought I'd use the words, in Oral Roberts' defense, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was money for his hospital, the City of Faith, which is adjacent to the campus. He was trying to marry his faith with uh, he, you know, right. healing it, with yeah. scientific principles, find That's a way to make exactly. them work together. To have a doctor that prays with you beforehand and right. then thinks of both the spiritual and physical causes. Absolutely. And um, if you've ever seen the campus, it all shimmers in gold. It looks like... It looks like the expo pavilion from the 60s has just been spray painted everywhere. It's incredibly, it has, it has this, he made it futuristic in a I way. I like that the sculpture of the hands that you have a photograph of. I actually think that's a pretty cool. <laughs> it's enormous. Yeah, it looks really cool. Well, and his city of faith was enormous. They've had to, I mean, they've had to find all kinds of uses for it because it was such a big building, but it is a huge tower beside it that whose, whose windows just kind of glitter gold. So why was it a so, scandal that he didn't hit his fundraising goal or what happened? That's right. So he was far short on the money he needed. And then he sent out a letter to fundraisers or his son did, I can't quite remember, that said that if he were not, if this money was not raised, that um, he had gone into his prayer tower, which is a tower in the middle of campus, um, and that he would not come back, I mean, come back home, that he was there to pray. But if the money was not raised, that God would, quote, ransom him home. So there was kind of an apocalyptic threat. Um, and then he sent a series of the follow-ups that didn't help. And um, and the result was just pure hilarity for anyone who didn't like it. And uh, and so, of course, he was They would just say he was mercenary or something? Like, oh, he's basically holding himself ransom? He is holding, yes. he Yes, that is exactly what they would say, that he is holding himself ransom. To take a sympathetic himself. view, like, did, did he really wanted his hospital to succeed? Did he see it as, as mercenary in that way? Or did you find in the records discussions where people were, like, he was being duplicitous about this? Or that he just was 
using what came to hand. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what his state of mind was. Um, I don't know what his state of mind was, but I do know that he was, um, incredibly, he was just, he was a force of nature. He was the kind of person who had a vision for something and then made it happen. And he was able to do that mostly through sheer force of his personality because he was such an, he was just such a magnetic figure. And so, I mean, when he believed in projects, he wanted to see them through to the end. And so, I, I mean, I personally doubt that he sort of was was planning this maliciously, but he certainly had a flair for drama that mm. well, he was willing to use in in multiple ways throughout his ministry. So that's one. What other kind of scandals cropped up at this time? That, that... Yeah. So then we get to PTL, Praise the Lord, the Empire of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. And Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were America's first, you know, first lady and president of this, of, of televangelism. They were, they were royalty in so many ways. Um, and they had this incredibly public marriage in which they would fight and tease and laugh and joke live as they did an entire marathon of shows. And it's both like a of them reality were, show a little bit. It really was very early reality programming, and they wanted to make Christianity fun. That's why their the center of their empire wasn't uh, wasn't a church. It was it was an, a theme park where people could bring families, and that's partly why they wanted their million shows with what became twenty four hour programming were incredibly over the top, and of course very prone to satire, which so Saturday Night Live had versions of them. Um, and her, Tammy Faye was famous for her over the top makeup, but people loved that very joyful sort of, yeah, they, they like, they kind of embraced the absurdity and made it work for them. And so when, when Jim was accused of first of homosexuality by fellow, by a fellow Christian celebrity and a, a news or radio personality. And then of uh, the, the one that stuck and that there was a very public trial for was a fraud that he had oversold the shares for their grand heritage hotel that they, um, that they had where it was like one of those kind of timeshare arrangements mm-hmm. and that he oversold it to make money and that um, he had used that money or someone from his organization had to pay off a, the year 21 year old secretary, Jessica Hahn for yeah. the um, tryst that they had, which of course, Jessica Hahn went on to do a very exciting playboy video of in which she does her own voiceovers. I mean, the whole thing. Yeah. Was so just, this is this, this yeah, this is a big mess. It got really public. I mean, the, 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 the news reporter who broke the story, I think he got, I mean, he got, I, I think a Pulitzer or something for it. I mean, just like a, a huge award. This was a, a major breakthrough to have found a financial paper trail and the fraud story just went over the top. And because they were already such dramatic personalities, there was a lot of weeping and singing and, mm. you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it, was, it became pure theater. As you're people. writing about it from a historian standpoint, did you feel tabloidy at all? I mean, we're only a couple decades removed. And so, yeah, well, yeah I mean, well, they've spoken so much about it that it they they kind of came to see that as accidentally defining their ministry. And so it was easy to find so many sources of them just thinking through what led to it and then the way they tried to define themselves after it. But in truth, it was the biggest Christian scandal in you know anyone's memory and really, I think, defined the downfall of Christian televangelism. And then there was one right after where Robert Tilton, who was very famous and no one acknowledges how bonkers famous he was before his fall, because of course everyone disowned him after was Diane Sawyer made her reputation, uh, showing how a, a, a whole staff of people would take the money out of the prayer envelopes and just throw out the prayers. And so mm-hmm. people were sort of so horrified by that footage that these were all one after another, after another, that it seemed like the televangelist was an unredeemable figure. We still have something like the 700 Club today. Those at Pat Robertson, was he connected to the movement at all? And, and how did he survive all of the scandals that, and now we have Creflo Dollar and people like Joel Osteen and these types of people that have uh, shows. Oh yeah. I mean, they didn't go anywhere. I mean, there's a great, uh, dissertation that became a book on uh, that was written right at the time that, that tracked all the numbers and what looked like 
a huge media death spiral was actually something like audiences went from 15 million to 10 million. Mm. So that's still 10 million people. Yeah, that's a big chunk. People. And cable TV is sort of on the rise at the time. So Yes, that's right. And, and part of it was just because there were too many prosperity, there were too many preachers on television and there was a natural hemorrhaging of as they're trying to consolidate TV shows. So it's in part just that people couldn't, um, there was less funding to go around and it was just a bit of a tough time in terms of the market. So it wasn't necessarily that people were just giving up on televangelists. And in truth, televangelists remarketed themselves so quickly that you could barely, I mean, there was just, you could barely catch your breath before the new breed of cool postmodern televangelists were on the screen. And there's also a, a, some developments in the prosperity gospel movement um, on a basement level, I think. And you differentiate between hard prosperity and soft prosperity. Talk about the difference between those and how that came about. Sure. Well, as I studied the movement, I began to see such a spectrum in the way, I mean, they were still all promising the same things using faith to gain wealth, health, and ultimate victory. Um, So rhetorically and all kinds of other reasons, they still looked and sounded and talked the same, but they had a different understanding of the nature of causality. So for hard prosperity, there seemed to be a very direct result between um, the unleashing of positive confession, so the speaking of positive words, and then the result. And there was always a very supernatural sense that things would be answered, often quite immediately. Um, So... uh, Prayer became a very direct spiritual power. So would you a might positive say, confession be something like, "I want to be rich." Like, what would what would an actual positive confession sound sure. like? Oh, not not even I want to be rich. Like, I am rich. You okay. can download any number of. So, if you a lot of people mega churches put their positive confessions online as kind of a vision statement for the church. So, mm-hmm. I am healthy. I am wealthy. I am happy. Um, all God's gifts are mine. I mean, just any number of affirmations, and. Uh, so that's hard prosperity is like huge promises and, and immediate results. Yes. Is that? Yeah. And, and there's a, and there's kind of a sense that once you've said it, it is accomplished. That's how powerful your words are. So for people who are, for example, sick, um, they'll very often be discouraged from perpetual prayer because it will be seen as a sense of unfaithfulness. Like, well, we already asked for it. Yeah. It's already accomplished. Whereas a soft prosperity, so a hard prosperity will be, a Creflo Dollar, a Kenneth Copeland, um, a Kenneth Hagen, Mike Murdoch. People are these people are willing to offer spiritual math, like hundredfold blessings. They're often quite specific in what they think God will do as a result. A soft prosperity is very often incredibly uses very therapeutic language to describe the nature between faith and results. That's a Joel Osteen, a Joyce Meyer, a T.D. Jakes. It's there, and the infrastructure is there. But they, they, they might assume that it's a more gradual result. So um, you might smile and the boss notices you and you get a promotion. And that would be seen, that would be described in the same language as the hard prosperity, mysterious envelope of cash, you know, next to your car or something. Okay. So uh, I wanted to talk about race at this point. Now, race plays a, a part in throughout the book, but I thought it would be interesting at this point to zoom in a little bit because there's this tension within the prosperity gospel movement between individualism versus communal efforts. So as you mentioned before, African Americans didn't receive the same kind of benefits financially um, after World War II, so there was difficulties there. So it might have been a harder pill to swallow to think about. It was easy to believe in the prosperity gospel when you were already on your way up. And and so people that weren't, especially in African American communities, uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't have the same drive to the prosperity gospel. Yet here we have African-American communities that are very involved in in the prosperity gospel. So situate them. Well, and first I'll say that the prosperity gospel is so adaptable across racially, across races, but also just across classes. And so for those who have not, it's a language of aspiration of hope For those who already have it, like the middle class who are also still aspirational, it's a language of ambition and frequently a language of justification. Mm -hmm. And for the very wealthy, I mean, it's just an explanation for what has already happened. And so in that sense, it really kind of traverses all economic situations. But African-Americans have contributed to the prosperity gospel in so many interesting ways, in part because they were the first to really tap into 
the importance of the high anthropology of the prosperity gospel. So you already have famous prosperity preachers in the 20s and 30s. So that is to say, in the height of American wealth, in the depths of the American debt and joblessness. So highs and lows, you have very famous prosperity preachers adapting to those situations and telling people that money and health and and a dream is possible for them. And these are your sweet daddy graces and your father divines. They're very often very direct about their new thought influences. And you can track different famous American African American prosperity preachers, you know, from the early 20th century until today. And and I th- I think the key is understanding how important like the kind of dignity that money and health brings. Some of the like Sweet Daddy Grace, for example, who like had his own toothpaste brand. He was so famous. And I, you know, there's I I put a picture in my book of the of the lovely um, outfits that he dressed that his church dressed in for this church banquet in which they're given names like prince and princess and queen. They're all dressed in white beautifully, and um, and I think he's dressed in fur or something at the front. And people always used to make fun of the kind of ostentatiousness of the black preacher when in truth they had, they had settled on such an important point that God finds dignity in their bodies, that their bodies can be a source of spiritual power when they say these certain words. And I've just found that that, that, that high sense that they are spiritually capable of anything has been such a tremendous uh, theological resource to people who, in the midst of Jim Crow, are denied so much. So I think we can see, I mean, all kinds of reasons that people join the prosperity gospel. But, you know, one, just, just in terms of the contemporary context, one real cultural marker is that uh, black prosperity churches dress up a lot more. And historically, black churches... Uh, in historic denominations, typically dressed up more, but but here it has a theological point. Look at what the Lord has done. See the difference that my faith can make, you know. And I've always found um, that there's such a sense of pride when I do interviews in like home ownership and car ownership and like just the the specificity of the way that they feel loved by God. And that I think I think is one of the strongest arguments for what a high anthropology in this theology can do. And the book goes on to talk about how there were tensions within uh, black communities over prosperity gospel, which is very individual driven versus um, black people who saw the need for systemic approaches to overcoming inequality and things like that. And that caused a lot of difficulties. It really flies in the face and gets back to historic debates of what are the, what will be the solutions to um, what will be the solutions to systemic systemic evil and injustice. And so are the, is it that God will uplift individuals, righteous individuals who act in righteous ways, or does God uplift communities and in what way? And so black churches were probably among the first of the denominational Pentecostals to be like, Oh boy, this is going to be, this is going to be a theological problem. And very frequently the first to criticize, which is completely appropriate because it's an insider conversation about the future of the black church. So that's kind of talking about wealth, um, kind of, again, the book expands quite a bit more than what we're able to touch on here, but moving on to health, uh, it taps into the same fundamental idea that, that God's intention for uh, his children is health and wellness, that Jesus on the cross earned redemption from sin, that people can tap into that, not just for wealth, but also for health. And we've already mentioned sort of the power of objects that that where people would have handkerchiefs or things like this that, that were thought to deliver healing properties. There's also this idea of acting as if, and you, you hinted mm-hmm. at this a little bit earlier. Yeah. I mean, they really believe in a performative health so that, you know, I've seen people, um, you know, pretend not to have their limp or try to walk without their cane or, I mean, and some of this comes out of late 19th century, um, faith healing movements, Uh, but a a lot of it is just the sense that, um, in that the pretending isn't a lie, it's a kind of declaration of what God is already doing. And so, I mean, that has good things and bad things. I mean, there's all kinds of studies, for example, about the role behavioralism can play in seeking better health outcomes. So maybe you, maybe you feel tired, but you get out of bed. Uh, in this case, 
um, it can also have more dangerous uh, consequences. So there's been examples on a more extreme level. Um, so there's one kind of, in, in this, there's a kind of spectrum of where they see medical interventions. So on one side, there's been famous examples of people letting, you know, letting kids die mm -hmm. because they only wanted to pray for them. Or um, Hobart Friedman was very famous in the 70s, and he let an ulcerated leg lead to his early death. And he was, again, much more famous than people will give him credit for. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways in which, so I think th there was recently a uh, controversy over whether Kenneth Hagin's church in their Eagle Mountain something headquarters had spoken against um, uh, immunization and whether that had led to some kind of outbreak. So there's always a debate about how much people should be intervening, how much people should be acting as if they're already healed, no matter what their medical intervention, or if they should be, or if there's a kind, or if it's more of a buffet style in which you can pray for it, you can act like it, and you can also see your doctor. Yeah, you. one of the things you did um, as a researcher was you actually attended uh, a, a church, the, the Victorious Faith Center in North Carolina, and there you encountered people who were heavily invested in the prosperity gospel, including the health elements, but some of them were healthcare workers themselves, and what kind of personal exchanges did you have with believers there on this topic? Yeah, because people always assume especially with black churches in poor areas, that the only reason they're praying for faith healing is because they don't have access. Because Jesus is, you know, the, the thought is Jesus is the only doctor they're going to see. And uh, and then they had access to some of the best health care in the world. And so it was always, um, it was so, so it was very interesting for, for me to talk with them about some of them were anti-immunization. Um, others would accept medical intervention to the point where they felt like, no, I'm just going to pray about it. Others would accept partial surgeries or whole surgeries. I mean, there was, they were quite, they were quite discriminating, which, you know, kind of going through my own health problems right now. I mean, there's a real wisdom actually in being discriminating in what you'll accept. And they, I think have rightfully intuited that black bodies don't always get the same care as white bodies and that they, and that they need to be their own advocates and maybe even assume that they have solutions that doctors don't have. So I think there's kind of a both and to the nature of their relationship to the healthcare system. Underneath it all, uh, again, it's just idea of God will make you well uh, if you have faith for that, and, or God will make you wealthy if you have faith that, for that. And you brought us up to the present uh, a little bit earlier in the discussion. Um, and one thing we haven't touched on is sort of the fact that the prosperity movement has gone global. In fact, I guess you did you did talk about how people say it's an American movement, but you've seen it manifest itself globally in different contexts. And what does that look like uh, briefly? Um, prosperity gospel sort of gone global. Well, there's certainly hubs in which it's very popular. So Nigeria is both a tremendous source of prosperity preaching and a huge export. So. The, one, the largest Protestant church in the Ukraine, for example, is run by a Nigerian pastor, Pastor Sunday. So there you'll see Nigerian preaching with Ukrainian folk dancing, and it is incredible. Have you been there? Oh, no, just YouTube it. YouTube oh, okay. it? Yeah. Oh, wow. how I'd love to go to Kiev right now. Yeah. Um, but there's, um, I've been to the, um, I've been to rural Texas to go to the annual conference for the Redeemed Nigerian Church of God. So, which is, um, no, sorry, it's Redeemed Christian something, oh gosh, who knows, but it's, um, it's Redeemed like Christian names, Church of God, I think, but it doesn't have the word Nigerian in it, but it is a Nigerian denomination, yeah. and it's one of the most um, powerful exporters of missionaries globally, just like the uh, Full Gospel Yangi, uh, um, Full Gospel Church in South Korea and Seoul, uh, used to be run by Paul Yangi Cho, um, it was reported that one million believers, largest church in the world, with a soft prosperity message. And they have sent out, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of missionaries globally. So you see hubs, you see a lot of cross crossing borders and adaptabilities to new cultures. You also see places that just confuse me, like it did really well in Sweden in the 80s. Huh. And I talked with someone about that the other day, but the assumption is that these are places without robust systems that will support people if they get sick or you know, not the most, one of the most egalitarian societies on earth. So mm. I still haven't figured out most of the puzzle that is the international prosperity gospels, incredible diversity. And I think this gets at one of the stereotypes that I had going into the book, which is the idea that the prosperity gospel offered 
uh, big promises for little effort. But in reality, there are some manifestations of the prosperity gospel that can be very demanding on people. Oh, man, they worked harder. They were just the spiritually hardest working people in show business. I had never seen believers spend as much time preparing for Sunday spiritually as the folks I met. And I really came to admire that. Their sense that God is revealed in the details of their life, I thought was very, um, very inspiring. Uh, it was, it was, it, and it wasn't just that they wholesale accepted whatever the preacher said, it was that they were making their own judgments, whether publicly or privately, about what was best for them. And that wasn't nearly as, yeah, stereotypical as you might expect. I think it's easy for a lot of outsiders who who don't um, align themselves with that movement to look at the few famous examples that we talked about, some of the scandalous things and and some of the excesses uh, of prosperity gospel preaching and just dismiss it out of hand without really trying to understand who the people are that it's appealing to. And your introduction includes a caution that seems to try to get people to understand that they actually probably share some things in common with people who are drawn to the prosperity gospel. Well, I think I think you're right that it appeals to universal claims that that we all have this we all have these very fragile, very basic desires for our life. We want to be healthy, we want to have enough money. Uh, many of us want kids and if we have them, we just desperately want them to turn out okay and for them to be healthy and for them to have enough money. I mean, what seems like a simple life is a list of very long and very difficult to secure demands, no matter whether you live in America or Botswana. And so, you know, it's easy for academics in particular, and me at that point writing for my neo-Gothic spires of Duke, you know, to, to be dismissive of people who are talking about money and looking for money. And then I go to my dramatically bedazzled church on Sunday, but it's bedazzled, you know, in tasteful stained glass. And, uh, and suddenly we are not talking about God's promises. We're talking about stewardship. And then suddenly I'm okay with, with other kinds of gods of wealth. So, yeah, I find that, I find that people, they forget how very delicate we all are, how much we just need the basics. And the prosperity gospel is great at the basics. They understand that the baseline of what we need and want from God and from each other is so very obvious. And they make promises directly related to our deepest needs. And so this book features your own personal voice and perspective, as we've talked about, I think more more so than a lot of histories do today. Do you think that your direct experience with actual people, like these worshipers, these people you spent time on a bus with or that, that gave you advice or uh, that spoke to you about their most personal beliefs, do you, how did that impact your work as opposed to work of of history where you're just dealing with records and people that are long gone? Sure. I mean, and this is a problem for so many of us who crisscross now into other disciplines, doing sampling and sociology, and in particular ethnography, that we are written into our stories in ways that we that is so uncomfortable. And I tried to embrace how very uncomfortable it was by showing them what I wrote as much as I could for comment and for suggestion, um, not to make it nicer, though that's always a temptation, but, um, but we miss a lot. And especially we miss a lot when we think something's slightly absurd. And I find that like people, you know, and you, and you, you develop a, such a thick sense of irony sometimes, even when you're trying to understand people at the most fundamental level. Um, so sometimes when I just didn't understand I got, it was the kind of point in which you get quiet and you write something down because you think, oh my gosh, this is research gold. That's actually the best point to ask another question mm. to say, you know, so for me, I might interview with this lovely nurse and finding that she hops off the table at this moment in which the doctor says she should get her, I can't remember what it was, but appendix or something out, just a simple surgery. And she's like, nope, I'm going to pray about it. She hops off the table and then I realized I just had a million other questions like, well, does it hurt now? And what do you do if it hurts now? And you're a nurse, so you have to diagnose people. Is that the same thing as negative confession? And what do you do about that? And she had answers for all of them that I would not have anticipated. And so just trying to step into the awkwardness of our subjectivity, I think, can I will make a pitch for that giving us better data than if we pretend that we're not having our own reactions to what people are saying. So, I mean, we'd learn a lot from anthropologists, really. 
That's Kate Bowler. She's assistant professor of American religion at Duke Divinity School. She's also the author of the book, Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel. We'll take a brief break and come right back. Believers and scientists have wrestled for centuries over the relationship between reason and faith, science and religion. Award-winning Latter-day Saint author and biologist Stephen Peck believes reason and faith are both indispensable tools we can use to understand God's creation. Evolving Faith, Wanderings of a Mormon Biologist is a collection of essays about Mormon theology, evolution, the environment, and other issues. Stephen Peck has the mind of a scientist, the soul of a believer, and the heart of a wanderer. In Evolving Faith, he provides welcome companionship for women and men engaged in the unceasing quest for further light and knowledge. Evolving Faith is part of the Living Faith book series from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. To learn more about this series, go to maxwellinstitute.byu.edu slash livingfaith. Living Faith books are available at amazon.com the Maxwell Institute podcast. We're talking with Kate Bowler. She's a professor of American religion at Duke Divinity School. We're talking about her book, Blessed, which talks about the American prosperity gospel. So Kate, I, I actually received your book, uh, I think back when it came out a couple of years ago, but hadn't got to it until now. And I actually saw a piece that you'd recently written in the New York Times that um, prompted me to take another look at the book. And there's something in your book's introduction that that took on new meaning uh, when I when I read the New York Times piece. In, in your introduction to the book, you write, it's a strange occupation to be a historian of divine well-being as your own is getting away from you. What was going on health-wise at the time you were writing this book? I had weirdly lost use of my arms. I was typing, and then all of a sudden they felt weird, and then they just went limp. And I, over the next year, I had just gotten my dream job. I just thought my life was finally kind of taking off. And then I spent the next year seeing over 100 doctors looking for a diagnosis. And that went from everything to uh, people saying I was crazy, that I was making it up, to them trying to remove my top ribs. And that just led to, like, to a million theological jokes about rib removal. I took that one around the dance floor as much as I could. And uh, to any number of sort of ill-advised arm surgeries um, that I contemplated or had. And uh, so it was, it was such a mystery, and the mystery was so frustrating. And in truth, it ended up being something super simple that eventually we could solve. I have overly lax joints, which when led, leading to too much instability leads to cutting off circulation, and then like, and then the lack of feeling. It was the most, it's just that it's the kind that I have is a little bit rare. And so... What ended up being, I, when I finally found treatment, I got better, you know, within another six months. I just still have to maintain it. But at the time, it really seemed like, I mean, I would get locked in bathrooms that I couldn't get out of because my mm. arms were too weak to turn the door handle. Mm. So it was, I couldn't type anymore. I had to find new ways of taking notes. I mean, my entire academic life was done for a while because I, I just, a whole semester of students that I was teaching had to get all their comments in emoticons. I was like, your paper makes me feel stamp happy. Yeah. <laughs> I had no use of my arms. And so trying oh, no. to just like keep your, keep your courage and your sense that something might turn out while you're navigating a complicated healthcare system, while you're daily interviewing people who probably think it's your own fault. So I was always at healing revivals with arm casts or, you know, which always led to theological conclusions. And it was both a tough year, but it was also academically quite fruitful because I, I stepped into the message, the pain of loneliness, of feeling judged, mm. but also just there are many, many ways of explaining pain uh, to, be, to be really intellectually helpful, though it was emotionally often really tough. So that's probably why my healing chapter is the little, is like a little more pangy than the mm. other chapters. Maybe if I was desperately poor, it would have been the money chapter, but I was really sick. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, that they got that situated. Um, more recently, you published this uh, kind of a follow-up. <laughs> there's more. Wait. Yes, there's but more. Wait. Yeah. Exactly. This, this piece in the New York Times. So I thought it would be best just to have you uh, maybe read from the beginning of that article to give people an idea of where you're at now. Sure. Um, let's see. 
On a Thursday morning a few months ago, I got a call from my doctor's assistant telling me that I have stage four cancer. The stomach cramps I was suffering from were not caused by a faulty gallbladder, but by a massive tumor. I'm 35. I did all the things you might expect of someone whose world has suddenly become very small. I sank to my knees and cried. I called my husband at our home nearby. I waited until he arrived so we could wrap our arms around each other and say the things that must be said. I have loved you forever. I am so grateful for our life together. Please take care of our son. Then he walked me from my office to the hospital to start what was left of my new life. But one of the first thoughts was also, oh God, this is ironic. I recently wrote a book called Lust. So where are you at now with that? Um, th thank you, first of all, for, for reading that. I know this uh, obviously is difficult to talk about, but it's something that you've been willing to talk about. Do you think your your background and your research has helped you want to uh, to talk about this publicly? I don't know. I mean, I still kind of go back and forth. Honestly, the only thing I really wanted to do was make an intervention into how people talk to sick people. Mm. Because all my time with the prosperity people taught me how much we all love our certainties. We all love our guarantees that our very delicate lives will all turn out. And as we know, as most of us know or have had glimpses of, life is really hard. I mean, even just in seasons, life is so hard. And so it was hard for me, though, to go from the you know kind of dispassionate um, historian to the making a few normative claims about what I think is right and wrong about the way that that movement addresses healing in part, you know, just with our training, we don't want to step in there and it just, it felt weird. But at the same time, I have to make more adjudicated decisions about how I spend my time. Cause I don't really know how much time I have at first. It was, I mean, it's all still very dramatic, but at first they gave me very low survival rates for five years. And so I, I was looking at about two years and that was just so intense. And, uh, and now, now I'm in a clinical trial at Emory. I'm actually just, so we're talking from Atlanta cause I have to fly here every week for treatment. And so I'm grateful to have a new drug to try. And I mean, but this is my first time with everything, you know, it's my first time being not just a historian. It was kind of nice to have history as a peer category before. It was like my mental vacation that I could go and just do my work. But now I'm a little bit professionally cancerous <laughs> just because there's so much overlap between this world I lived in and and just the reality of what I live in now. Like I cannot go 10 feet without someone giving me advice mm. about what to do and not to eat sugar and have I tried this. And What kind of religious ideas are people bringing to you or that oh, you picked up during your research? That, yeah. You're saying you're trying to also do an intervention here about the way people talk. So what kind of religious things do you encounter? Oh, man, because I didn't realize how much it was shared. I mean, just how – I mean, so I got, I've gotten 800 discreet emails from strangers telling me – usually the worst things that have ever happened to them, you know, their children dying of cancer and the video they created of their, the things they wanted to say to their dying parent or, so it's been a lot of that, but there's been a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I'm a fundamentalist, I'm a prosperity person, just all kinds of the religious gamut. And, um, I mean, a lot of them got the point, which was that it is very painful for people to pour certainty on your pain, especially in the midst of it. I mean, we have these very trite ways of explaining and reacting uh, to pain in our culture that are not just facile, but they're just sort of obnoxious to people who are trying to just live it. For example, um, give us some examples. Oh, like what, yeah. For a reason, man, everything always happens for a everything reason. Everything happens for a reason, right? And I mean, I got an email from someone the other day that said that he knew that and he really, you know, just so you know, everything does happen for a reason. And I figured that out when my cat died. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm so happy for you. If that is, if that is mm -hmm. a peak of cancer, I am happy for you. Um, or God is always opening doors and closing windows. Yeah. It's just totally his jam. Um, a lot of it is attempts at 
a health solutions. So, you know, I joked about in a piece, but like a lot of, have you tried this kale nonstop kale, man, the kale evangelists are a whole force. Um, a lot of, uh, have you read this study about sugar? You shouldn't be eating that. I mean, people have all kinds of helpful suggestions for people in pain and they love to give them. And my little sister, I think she said something so wise. She was just like, well, it is because, you know, they love you. Yes. Well, not those strangers. They don't love me, <laughs> but right. the people are frantic and, and frequently, you know, they just, they just grab for whatever's there and what's there is ideas about the power of the mind to overcome all things. I have, I get a lot of that. Um, there's no such thing as luck. You just need to try, you just need to try harder. I'm sure there's a way out of this. There's, I mean, people are fine kind of with a sudden death. Yes. Very tragic or sudden healing, but the ambiguity of staring down death, which I am required to do because at this point I still have inoperable tumors. So if this drug doesn't go well, I don't yet have other choices. So I live in this interim time in which every 60 days I get a scan that tells me if I get another 60 days and that's how my life works. So it has a very short mental tether in which I am not able to enjoy certainty. And that requires me to live in the present with my beautiful kid and my perfect husband and my lovely life that I am now more grateful for than ever before. So it's hard to move people away from these lovely conveniences, these joyful illusions that we, that prop up our lives and help us feel sure. But I mean, the truth is none of us know what's going to happen to us. So I just have to live in it in a more ridiculous way. There's a sense in which we feel driven to tell someone what the story is. Like we need yes. an explanation. Yes. That's we'll, right. That's but, exactly right. But we're like drawing them in to a story that, that, that's not their story. Yes. Yeah. And I've, I've felt, you know, I've experienced loss in my own family. Um, and, uh, there's a sense in which it's like you say, you, you, for a lot of these people that come to you, you, you understand that there's a desire to care there, that there's like, this is not malicious, Yes. but it does not take away the pain that, that those types of approaches can bring to you. Now, the tricky part then is we still want to comfort people or we want to be there for people. What kinds of advice would you give for someone who has a family member who's diagnosed with, with an illness like this or that, that has a friend? Uh, what types of thing, uh, things are available? I mean, you're, you're a Christian. Uh, yeah. So what types of things do you suggest yeah. people consider? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm new to this, but the two things I think of a lot are I have the present. I have the beautiful now, the fact that it's, it's gorgeous out. I get to talk to you. I get to do fun things in my job. I mean, what's happening right now? And then there's a kind of eschatological horizon of like the inbreaking of the kingdom, the beauty, the beauty of God's vision of us and the what and, and the what will be. And if someone has questions for those things, you know, you can be patient and loving and do your very best or defer them to other stuff. But most people want you to live in the dead zone of the in-between of the talking about outcomes and certainty and forcing you to retell the story and then, and then respond to their anxiety about the story. And, and it's, I think of it like the place between borders, right? Like no one's allowed to live there. It's just, it's a dead zone. And I find that there's just no life there for me. I can't, I cannot live there and just stay and stay and live my life. And so if you can in any way not ask people to be professionally their disease by forever asking them to live in that dead zone to, and mostly just realize that people don't want your certainties. Like they're struggling with their own. If they bring it up and they're, they have their own stuff, then great. But mostly they just need loving presence and encouragement in the face of just a hug or really just praying for you. No one wants to hear. I know it's going to be okay because guess what? You don't no. and neither do I. And asking people to pretend for you is exhausting. Mm. So, yeah, it's just living in the ambiguity and just being willing to walk alongside, I think, is is the most beautiful thing you can do for somebody. That's Kate Bowler. Today we talked about her book, Blessed, A History of the American Prosperity Gospel. I really appreciate you taking your time to talk about this book and to also to talk about um, your personal life as well. 
Thanks. So glad to talk to you too.